How you doing, Chris? My name is Chad. <laughs> Hey, Chad! Oh, we never did. It never did come out. I'll do the whole thing like that. Jazz hands. Oh, right. With everything. So we do, we'll do this quick. Name, rank, and serial number, kind of. Uh, what's your name and what, what part of the project is uh, My name's Chris Garges. Uh, I, I was a, a co-producer, recording engineer, mixing engineer, and the drummer on uh, most of the Be Good to Yourself record. Excellent. And can what, are there any, what other bands and outfits are you kind of connected to? <laughs> um, I've been the drummer in the Sponge Tones uh, since uh, 2014. Um, I've been playing drums with Mitch Easter since 2007. Um, and I play in a bunch of different sort of bands around Charlotte, different things that pop up at different times. And um, yeah. So how did Bone to rope you into this? <laughs> Um, I guess uh, I've been a, I've been a part of a few records that uh, the Ed and Rob's band, um, the Luxuriance that Ann's did, at my studio. Um, they uh, they did a project there with Mark Williams Engineering, and then uh, then I wound up doing a couple, couple for them there. So I, I had a, a good working relationship with those guys. I, like we we got to really like each other and uh, and sort of understood where where we were all coming from. And we had a, a good we all had a good. Uh, symbiotic working method you know yeah, and during the recording of be good to yourself and we got a couple of questions about that was there was there any moment or or thing that particularly stood out to you that kind of hit you or you know, there was just a great musical moment or and i with the challenges inherent in doing it with the pandemic <clears throat> yeah um i don't know you know i mean I, I think we went into this just with this plan of kind of having fun and doing something that was a little well, it was a lot smaller scale than what it wound up being, but I think once we got the sort of basic tracks on the first few songs, it was like, these sound really good. And then when we went through a few different vocalists on a few different songs, when we finally got the right people, it was like, man, this is really good. So it was kind of a nice, a nice little surprise from the top, you know, and I think everybody kind of felt that way. So again, there was this, you know, this sort of thing, like everybody's on the same path, you know, like everybody had the same beliefs and, and if you can, just a little bit more detail, logistically and, and kind of practically, what your role was, meaning they came to you, you know, about producing and doing, and that you did it in your studio down in Charlotte. If we can kind of bring that regional piece of the narrative in from you, and then what, you know, how that came, kind of, how how you guys did it, the method, your process. Um, okay, yeah. So, um, so uh, basically what eventually, what sort of wound up working out was we would, <clears throat> um, Ed would generally send me a few songs and say, we're going to plan on recording these three or four, like on, on, you know, these few days that we had booked. And, um, so, uh, so I would learn them and then maybe like sort of put some thought into how we might do them differently. Or they, they had a lot of ideas about that and I would think about how to facilitate that or, and eventually got where they would, they would get together with Gino and rehearse, um, up here in Winston-Salem. And then they would send me sort of rehearsal recordings and, and I might make some suggestions like, oh, maybe we should try this a little faster, a little slower, or maybe we should think about the shags while we're recording this or something like that. And uh, <clears throat> um, and then when we got to the studio, we sort of had a plan, but, but we would everything was still really loose, which was nice. It was it was like we had we had a general concept together and we would get sounds that sort of worked with that concept. Um, but then we would sort of see what worked and what didn't. And everybody was pretty flexible about it, which was great. So, and again, it, because everybody was on the same, you know, the same frame of mind, we could, we could work to get something that, that was really cool that, that everybody was eventually happy with. So. Well, knowing kind of the fandom thing you were talking about, you'll understand this question. That was there something about being able to tie together what Ed and Robin and, did, and Gino did, tying together artists from the Triangle, from the Triad, and then down south in Charlotte, that for you as a producer or someone who is definitely you know involved in the North Carolina music scene, what people sound like, was it kind of fun? Was it kind of like playing with action figures and getting to go, ooh, if I can get it, you know? And if you can kind of reiterate the question a little bit, but is yeah. it is it fun to be able to go, ooh, I, I always want to hear some these person do a song like this or work with this artist? Yeah, it was a lot of fun working with different people from all around the state. I mean, a, a bunch of them were people that I knew. I mean, some of the people that I brought to the pro project were mostly people from Charlotte. Um, but it, it was great to get to work uh, with, with Peter Holsapple, for instance, in a professional environment because I'd known Peter for a while, but I never got to work with him. And that, that was an absolute treat. And it was great to, to get Snooze involved on, on some stuff, although I, I still have yet to meet him face to face, you know, like, but I've been a fan of his for a long time. And, um, 
there was a lot, of, and there were a lot of a lot of great new um, people that I wasn't familiar with. Lib uh, Libby Rodenbaugh was great, and uh, Faith Jones was great, and and uh, I mean I'm just sort of throwing names out, but but so many people were really really wonderful. I mean Doug Davis was another sort of key part of this thing, and I'd known Doug for a long time, um, and uh, had been involved with some of the Vagabond Saint stuff. I'd seen a few of those shows and had, had played some of them with Mitch, um, but. Uh, but had never gotten to work with him in a professional capacity, and he was, you know, he was a really important part of this project too. So that it was cool, cool getting to work with all these people from all over different, different places and stuff. And we got one guy who is kind of being camera shy on this one. So if you can, just real quick, speak to like Gino's contribution, and at least in how he interfaced with you during the process. Oh, Gino was great. You know, I mean, again, like he's got such a such um, such a long history with Ed and Rob. Um, you know, to have him come in and to listen to how he and Rob interact as guitar players, that can be a tricky thing. It's like with a lot of bands, you wind up with two guys kind of playing the same thing. And sometimes that's cool, but sometimes that's really boring. Or then sometimes you have the sort of thing where two guys sort of sound like they aren't paying attention to each other at all. And that can be cool, but that can also just be a little too weird sometimes. But um, Ed and Rob really seem to have this kind of thing that's that really works together. Like their sounds are really different and their playing styles are different. And, um, or, sorry, Gino and Rob uh, have these playing styles that are that are really complementary and their sounds are, are really different but in a way that works together. And so um, to hear Gino come in and do his stuff and Rob do his stuff, and, and most of the stuff we were cutting together, and then we would eventually do some overdubs um, later on. But... Uh, but it, was, but it was really great, and I think I think Gina really came up with some some of the kind of riffs and things that would sort of define the stylistic direction of how we were going to do a particular song. Um, and then I, I think Rob sort of come up with things that sort of colored that, and it worked really really well. Was and plus plus Gino should definitely be credited for bringing some of his fantastic Italian uh, gravy and meatballs to the session just to keep us uh, keep us in good shape. Yeah. Right. Ask him about Colossal Head. Oh. <laughs> well, well, yeah, what, okay, what's that? Because I have no idea. That's definitely not oh. my research. Oh, yeah. sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a, for those of you who don't know, there is um, a really absurdly great uh, record that Los Lobos did uh, in 1998, I think, um, called Colossal Head. And I'm a huge fan of that record. And it's a very, it's a really bizarre sounding record. But it's a, it's for me, it's an incredibly like emotionally evocative, uh, emotionally evocative record. It's a, it's kind of a party record. It's just it's fun, but it's it's weird and it's really compelling, and um, and a lot, like a lot, of, it's one of those records that people tend to sort of like, if you know about Colossal Head, it's like oh yeah yeah you know you know, that kind of thing. But we were we were sitting around, we did a lot of listening to the music like on these sessions, just hanging out and having fun. And um, and there was there was one night where where that exact thing happened. It was like uh, we were hanging out, and Colossal Head came up in conversation, and, and Ed knew the record, but Rob didn't. And it was like, oh, sir, you know, you're not leaving for like 45 minutes, and you know, put on the record and listen to listen to it, and it was just like mind blowing for Rob, but but it continues to be mind blowing for me every time I hear it. So we just had a had a great time, kind of listening to that and getting jazzed up about it and um, and that led to a lot of interesting experimentation from then on you know um, just because of the nature of that record and it's so much fun so. was there any song in particular doing this knowing what you guys are there to raise money for knowing what the end result of the album is we'll get to that was there any song here that kind of because they're real thematically strong and then some of these songs really hit is there anything that really kind of just kind of hits you in the solar plexus, just really got you emotionally as you were working on that song? Well, I mean, there were a couple of them. I'm, I mean, like, Essence was a really good one right off the bat because, um, to, like, to be honest, when we started this, like, I wasn't entirely clear about the full picture of the project, um, like, thematically. And uh, I, I was just sort of under the impression that we were just sort of doing a fun record of covers, you know. But um, but Essence was such a great song, and, and I didn't know it, you know. Uh, but it's like, 
lyrically like a really powerful song. And um, and I thought that that and that was the very first thing we recorded. And um, like the basic track came out great. And then we did some overdubs that were really fun. And then got Maya Beth Atkins in to sing it. And she just absolutely nailed it. And so, you know, that was one, again, sort of, as soon as we got it all together, it was like, man, like we're on to something good. And so we set the bar pretty high to begin with. And it was like, okay, we gotta, we have to keep up with this, you know? Um, uh, Late was another really good one, the Ben Folds song. Because if you're familiar with the original version, it's kind of a Ben Folds thing, you know? It's, it, it's got, you know, a lot of things you would expect from Ben Folds. And, um, and we were originally talking about doing that with just with piano and vocals and strings. And um, uh, I got my friend John Elderkin to sing it. I thought he'd be a good person for it because he's he's got a good like sort of heartfelt, like a sincere sort of approach to singing. And he likes songs that are story songs with kind of some heartbreak and stuff. So um, so we asked John to do it, and uh, I wanted to make sure that we had a good key for him to sing and stuff. So I said, well, uh, learn it on guitar and do kind of an arrangement that's comfortable for you to sing and send that to us and then we'll get it to a piano player to sort of work some stuff out and then we'll get the strings to work out on top of it. And the demo that he sent was so good, um, just his little iPhone demo with the acoustic guitar, that it, 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 it was kind of amazing. And I sent it to Ed and Rob and it was like, that's it, don't touch it, like we'll put strings on it. But And fortunately, John had done this demo, he was sort of goofing around, he was experimenting with some multi-track audio program on on either his his iPhone or his iPad or something. So he had recorded the guitar separately from the vocal. So I said, can you just send me the demo guitar track? And he did that. And then we we went into my studio when we put up really nice microphones and we recorded like, you know, a real guitar track, um, which is what he thought we were going to be using. Um, but uh, th there are a couple of spots where the original, the demo guitar sort of goes, it, it trades off with the, <clears throat> the studio guitar recording, but uh, but it's mostly his original demo guitar on that, and and I thought that came out really great. Again, uh, you know John's vocal performance is absolutely stellar. Okay, <laughs> and um, knowing what the subject is at hand and what we're raising money for here today, are there any unique, in your opinion, any unique mental health challenges and challenges of addiction that that confront musicians just because of what their profession is like? just because of what the situation is like. I think artists in general, you know, I mean, you can sort of make some stereotypes about artists, but a lot of them are, are true, you know, that artists are uh, are generally pretty connected to their emotions, you know, and, um, and artists often uh, tend to sort of t tend to notice things and take things in, you know, a lot of that's, that's what often provides inspiration for them. You know, because artists tend to soak things in, um, I think the, the stuff that, that's been happening the last few years has, uh, is, has been really sort of tricky, you know? Um, uh, I mean, not only financially has it been difficult for artists, but it's also, it's for a lot of artists, their outlets have been cut off, you know? I mean, live performance is such an important thing to most to most musicians and to have that just sort of yanked out from under you for at first what seems like might be a few weeks and it turns into a few months and then turns into a year and a half or whatever and then maybe we'll come back and then maybe we won't it's just a, it's a tricky thing you know and um and most of the people i know have, have fortunately fared it pretty well but but a lot of people haven't and um so of course the the timing on this wasn't intended to be like this i mean we started this before any of that but it turned into sort of an important player with this kind of thing you know including having to do so much of the album remotely with people recording at their home studios or different studios and you know us sending them tracks and them sending tracks back to us and all that kind of stuff did you is this how many projects did you work on during the pandemic was this one of several and was it did each one was it unique or did this provide unique challenges because of the number of different artists that are involved well i mean i, I mean i was working on a lot of on a fair amount of stuff i mean i, I was fortunate i mean things were still tough but I, but i was fortunate to have some things to work on um but the be good to yourself album was really really terrific for me be, like because it was a really good outlet and because it was a, um, you know, it was a serious project, but it was 
low low pressure in terms of you know there's not we don't have to have it out by this date we don't have we aren't planning a tour behind it we aren't, like um you know so in terms of that just the, the mantra became just do ev do everything as well as we can and so you know sometimes uh, rarely but sometimes we would get tracks from people and say like it's cool but could you try this and and we you know and that those are things that might have gone a little quicker if people had been in the studio with us and we've, we've been able to make suggestions but um but it all worked out pretty great. I mean, it, uh, for this album, it all worked out pretty great amidst the interesting challenges. All right, and the last question, man, and I'm gonna let you go. What, uh, if you could look out of the audience and talk to people potential about why should people buy this album? <laughs> and I don't mean just the music, I mean literally the physical media, the, the CD and or, and or the album, rather than just stream it, you know? Well, I mean, the, the you know, all the proceeds from this are, are going to the benefit Abundance North Carolina, and, or Abundance NC. And um, and that it's that's a really unique organization. I mean, in that it's a it's an organization that's providing professional musicians with uh, stuff that they don't they don't easily have access to, especially if they're uninsured or or can't afford um, proper mental health care or or a, a, you know addiction assistance or any of that kind of stuff. Um, so this is a it's a unique organization and it's the the album itself is all going to sort of help raise funds for that to get these programs to happen um so i think it's i think it's really great that all these artists have come together to help other artists in, in, with something that they're not usually offered help with this is it's a really unique thing and i really hope it it takes off and thank you yeah. that was it quite welcome